Lord Jesus, you are the solid rock on which we stand. And compared to all other things, you alone are solid. Could we stand on our own abilities, on our own strength, on our own goodness, we would be forever lost. But to hope in you, to stand upon you, is to stand on solid bedrock. God, we thank you for your grace, the grace of being able to know you through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of having your words in our own language that we can read and know your mind and your heart. That we pray this morning as we come before your word, come under your word, that you would give us aid to be soft, to be malleable, to be changed this morning by it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Have you looked up at the stars lately and contemplated the fact that it takes a long time for light to get here? Light travels at 186,000 miles per second, and the sun is eight minutes away. The planet Neptune is four hours away. Proxima Centauri, the closest star to us, is 4.2 years away at 186,000 miles per second. Alpha Centauri, 4.3 years away. The Milky Way galaxy is said to be 100,000 light years in diameter and over 1,000 light years thick. We have neighboring galaxies, other clusters of stars. These neighbors are anywhere from 25,000 to 460,000 light years away. That's our galactic neighborhood. And then, of course, there are distant galaxies, millions and billions of light years away. You know what's really funny about all of that? Why the astronomy lesson this morning? Because fundamentally, you and I naturally are very bad astronomers. Now, we're tempted to think that all of those things revolve around us. That we're the center of the world, perhaps the center of the solar system, the galaxy, the universe. We're practically very bad astronomers. We have an innate bent towards self-occupation, self-centeredness, self-exaltation, and self-absorption. What we've been looking at in the book of Romans is the reign of grace in flesh and blood. What does it look like when someone is transferred from the tyranny of sin and death and given over by God's grace under a new reign, a new dominion? What Paul calls in Romans 5.20, the dominion of grace. We have a new master, a new king. There is a new power within us. The reign of grace is working a revolution in the heart. You have been positionally transferred from a tyranny under sin and law and death and ultimately destruction. Under a new realm of grace and the love of God and adoption and belonging and eternal life. And that is true for every Christian. And when you've been transferred out of the dominion of sin and under the dominion of grace, something new happens because this dominion of grace is going to be working out Christ-likeness progressively in the heart of every believer. And it doesn't all happen at once. There is a progressive conformity to Christ in the Christian life. You will be perfectly conformed to Christ the day you get hit by a bus and go to be be with him. But until that time, you and I face a battle, a war. A war that is the fight between the progressive conformity to Christ being wrought by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit of God in the heart of every believer and residual depravity, that which remains from the old life. And listen, victory in this battle is absolutely assured. We have been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, Romans 8, 29. However, on this life, there is a battle for fruitfulness here, a battle for usefulness, a battle for progressive conformity to Christ that puts the trophies of grace on display, proclaims the gospel to a watching world, makes supernatural power evident at the heart level in a life. The war is on, and self 
is in the crosshairs of grace. (laughs) This battle for grace in the heart in a progressive conformity to Christ has self in its crosshairs. This morning, as we look at Romans 12, we'll be looking at verses 14 to 16. I want us to see that the reign of grace enlists what I call unnatural impulses in the overthrow of the reign of self. Grace is going to produce in us and command of us some character qualities, some desires, some impulses that are not natural. And these impulses serve to undo those residual elements of love for self, self self-centeredness, self-absorption. Those tendencies in the human heart, in the heart of a believer still, that want to put self back on the throne rather than the Lord Jesus Christ on the throne of a life. And grace has these impulses to employ in the heart to overthrow the reign of self. And I'll give them to you all up front, three words, goodwill, sympathy, and humility. That's what we're looking at this morning, goodwill, sympathy, and humility. And while these function as commands, they are also the product of God's grace in the life. That is, grace can command believers to do things. Did you know that? And provide the resources by which obedience to those commands are done. And if you and I cultivate goodwill, sympathy, and humility, as our text this morning will lay out for us, we will see an increase in Christ-likeness, an increase in usefulness, an increase in fruitfulness in this life that God has designed for us. Make no mistake, these are not natural to the human constitution. These go against the grain of our culture and our world. And up to this point in Romans 12, we've had some really remarkable commands given to us. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Prefer one another in honor. uh, Be diligent in laboring for the Lord. Pursuing um, hospitality. I think this next set of commands gets a little more personal and perhaps a little more difficult. Would you read with me here, Romans 12, 14 to 16. This is God's word. Here is what grace commands under the reign of grace. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Now, these three verses and the series of commands that these verses hold are personal. They are cutting. They are convicting. And they have as a common thread the getting away from self, putting yourself aside, enlisting these elements of grace, these unnatural impulses, to put death to self. Under the reign of grace, we are being led by the Holy Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body. And here, those deeds are the ones that rise up when we are full of self. The first one is simply goodwill. Goodwill, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And you think, oh, goodwill's easy. There's one on every corner. I'm not talking about a thrift store, right? I was tempted here to use the word charity. That would have rhymed, right? Um, charity, sympathy, humility. If you want to rewrite the outline and do that, that's really nice. Charity's an old English word that means love, self-giving love. And, and if you think charity, giving to the poor, and goodwill is a thrift store, we're going to miss the point. The idea here is I have a positive disposition towards somebody. I want somebody's best. I have goodwill towards them. I feel and I act from goodwill towards somebody. This is what the word bless means. And and as you read the word bless throughout your Bible, uh, different people bless different people in different ways, and the word has sort of a semantic range. It, It most fundamentally means to bestow favor. And so when God blesses people, blessed is the man who... When, when God blesses people, God is bestowing his favor. God brings about happiness for those whom he blesses. 
God blesses you, the result is you are happy. When people are said to bless God, it is an expression of praise, to extol him, uh, to, to dispense favor towards him. And when people are said to bless others, they are in effect asking God's favor upon others. To bless someone else is essentially to ask God to bless them. It's the way to express your desire for God to deal favorably with somebody. You are saying, I want the best for you. And the best by God's definitions. And here, the command is to bless those persecuting you. This goes against the grain. This is unnatural. We saw this word for persecuting in, in just the previous verse. It was uh, practicing hospitality. It's that word to pursue hospitality. Uh, sometimes this uh, word to run after something can be something good. Uh, but most often in the New Testament, this running after something is to run after someone to harm them. And so translated here the word persecute. And, and every time this is used of people in the New Testament, of, of Christians being persecuted, it is those enemies of the gospel who have set themselves up as therefore enemies of Christians and work and labor and run to do Christians harm. And the command here is bless those persecuting you. It's to mistreat um, and, and the idea here of, of persecution doesn't always end in death. It can be mistreatment of any kind. The command to bless them is followed up by another command. Do you see it there in verse 14? Bless those who persecute you. Notice the next command. Bless them. <laughs> Paul says it twice. And I think he says it twice because this is so hard. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. To curse is to wish them harm. It is to call God's disfavor upon them. And in our culture today, vengeance is seen as a virtue. Right? Think about the movies, the literature. The heroes, the protagonists are, also, are often those who have been harmed and they are out to personally make things right. And we line ourselves up with the protagonist and we can't wait for them to get revenge. This is the world's way of thinking. In fact, it's almost considered dishonorable not to avenge a wrong. What are you, weak? What, you don't love your family? You need to make this right. That is the world's way of thinking. That is natural man's way of thinking. And this command goes against the grain severely. Even in stories where the protagonist is harmed and they don't carry out your revenge and you say, oh, isn't that sweet? What is the audience hoping for? That the villain will get what's coming to them, right? And even if the protagonist doesn't deal the final death blow, the villain somehow slips or falls to their death. And the, we, the audience, go, yeah. That is not the call of the Christian, my friends. The command here from God is to desire their best. To actually wish that the villain were blessed by God. That the villain were dealt favorably by God. To long for them not to get just desserts. And listen, even if you and I refrain from outward retribution, do we find in our hearts the desire for some harm to befall them? Not by my hand, of course. I, I won't take vengeance. Vengeance is the Lord's, but I hope it happens. Do you harbor hard thoughts against people who have wronged you? You might even feel some satisfaction if somehow they just got their desserts Listen, Proverbs 17, 5 says, he who rejoices at calamity will not go unpunished. We're not to do that, <laughs> to rejoice at calamity. The command here is to wish them well, to pray that God would actually bless them, to make them happy, to give them cause for rejoicing. And this requires a renovation at the heart level. 
a revolution against who you naturally are, an uprising against residual depravity in our hearts. This is grace exacting a progressive overthrow of what comes natural to us. In obedience to this command here, it is not enough simply not to take revenge. We must cultivate a heart-level desire for their good and to see God bestow kindness and favor upon them. We should actually want them to be made happy, to receive God's gracious dealings. We love to be gracious to one another. We know that there is a right response and, and oftentimes our first response is not what it should be. And so we wanna be patient with each other and give the brother a chance to have a second response. That is, a, that is a great and gracious way to deal with one another. But when it comes to your own heart, are you working hard to close the gap between a first or natural response and the second response? Wouldn't it be great that your second response would be your first response? And think about what happens when it's not. To harbor evil thoughts in my immediate response to some circumstance, some hurt. Look, it would be great if I, if I felt those things and then in a matter of hours, I'm able to turn those around and not act out on what felt natural to me. But honestly, what would please the Lord? To, to so cultivate in my heart a fertile soil for the rich response of love, of self-emptying kindness and goodwill to those who might make themselves my enemy. If my first response to being wronged was immediately to respond in goodwill, eager for God to bless them and asking God to do so, <laughs> that would please the Lord. And a delay in that exposes the residual self-interest that still needs to be put to death in me. And I think we all feel this. There's a remarkable example in the news recently. A Dallas police officer, after a long shift, tired, exhausted, uh, went back to her apartment in uh, 2018, thought it was her own apartment. She had gone to the wrong floor, identical door, same location, wrong floor. The door was open. She went in and seeing the resident assumed he was an intruder and she shot and killed him. Innocent. Uh, he was innocent. She was not. His name is Botham Jean. Uh, Botham's brother took the witness stand in the police officer's trial and said to her, I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. I love you just like anyone else and I'm not going to hope that you rot and die. I personally want the best for you. I wasn't gonna say this in front of my family. I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you because I know that's exactly what Botham my brother would want for you. Give your life to Christ. I think giving your life to Christ is the best thing Botham would want for you. He then went on and asked the judge if he could give the defendant a hug. And the judge said, yes. And then later on, the judge, who was a believer, took out her own Bible and gave it to the defendant opened it to John 3.16 and pointed to John 3.16 and gave her a hug. Both Botham and the judge have received <laughs> furious response from the world. Look, the, the, the police officer did wrong. She, she goes to jail. She has to pay for what she did and it's right to do so for a believer who has been wronged in a way that's just hard to imagine, to extend compassion and forgiveness and to wish goodwill upon the perpetrator of evil against you is so good. And listen, Christian, this is so hard to do. What does it look like to bless a persecutor? Pray for them, Jesus said, Matthew 5, 44. 
speak kindly, refuse to slander them in your heart, encourage them, build them up, forgive them. When persecuted, think this, Christian. Think about hell. Think about the lake of fire and a great white throne judgment and anybody whose name is not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Consider your persecutor on that day. And Christian, consider your own sin. What do you deserve from a holy God? What if it's a believer that mistreats me? All the more, we ought to love humbly and selflessly. And not produce a cycle of mistreatment. Christ-likeness will win the day. The truth will win the day. Friends, this is hard. This is unnatural. And it requires, number one, a work of grace. You have to be a believer, overturned, overhauled, revolutionized by the gospel of Jesus Christ to even entertain thoughts like this and say, yes, that's right. That's what I want to do. And if you don't find the capacity to even think this way in your heart, friend, check your standing before God. You might need a fundamental revolution at the heart level through the gospel. Secondly, this requires an eternal perspective. You're asking God to favor them, eternally speaking. You're asking God to forgive their sins, to forgive their sins against you. you. You've got to get self out of the way and realize that the one who has offended you will answer to his maker and face the penalty for his crimes forever and ever and ever. And if you pause and just think, what will it be like 26,000 years from now when my opponent is bearing under the unbearable wrath of God for their sins against me still. You would weep and say, no more, stop. So imagine that when you're offended. And what did it mean for Jesus Christ to bear the sins of believers at that same great infinite proportion to forgive them, even though he was the one far more offended than you and I could ever be? Listen, this is the perspective Paul had. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, to this present hour, we are hungry, thirsty, poorly clothed, roughly treated, and homeless. We toil working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. We're considered scum of the earth. <laughs> That's the way Paul viewed his own life. When William Tyndale viewed his life that way. Uh, as he was being martyred, he was being killed. October 6, 1536, his last words were, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. <laughs> what did he want? He, he wanted the, the truth of the gospel of God's forgiving, saving grace to be known to all England. <laughs> he wanted the best for his persecutors. John Hooper, he was one of the martyrs under Bloody Mary in the English Reformation. February 9th, 1555, he was burned at the stake. And he was burned at the stake because he believed in an English Bible and he preached the gospel. Those were his crimes. And to the young man assigned to start the fire under him, who said, forgive me, I have to start the fire. John Hooper said to him, you have done nothing to offend me. May God forgive your sins. And they were like Stephen in Acts 7, 60. As he's being stoned, he fell on his knees and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. And of course, our Lord Jesus Christ, who hanging on the cross, said, Father, forgive them to his murderers. This requires remarkable faith. First Peter 2 details this. You have been called for this purpose since Christ has also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. Christian, you're gonna suffer. It's part of, the, part of the life of following Christ. Follow Jesus' example who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Your safety under mistreatment and persecution, Christian, is entrusting yourself to God who judges righteously. He knows all things. He sees all things. Entrust yourself to him. It's faith. And this also requires a progressive overthrow of self. 
You've got to be actively engaged in the progressive overthrowing of self in the heart. Should you wait until Christianity is illegal to practice this verse? Memorize it, put it on a card, and wait till you're being burned at the stake. No. No, the heart attitude that would prepare a Christian to bless persecutors is seen in how you respond to petty offenses now, to the inconveniences and irritations of life, to the way we rub against each other and cause hurt. Robert Haldane said, how many are there who calling themselves Christians openly and without shame utter maledictions on those who irritate them? How few abstain from imprecations of every kind and degree. Do you find yourself muttering under your breath when somebody inconveniences you? That is a great testing ground, trying ground, proving ground for this hard attitude. And to do this, you have to be eager to set aside your own preferences and your own particularities. You have to be eager to not take offense. And as one pastor said, truly what should offend us is what offends God and no more. What happens in your heart when a brother or sister in Christ mistreats you, offends you, comes after you unjustly, speaks evil of you? Here's the command, bless. Bless and do not curse. Don't wish for vindication of your cause. Pray rather for God to favor them. (laughs) Friends, this is hard stuff. It's not natural. There is a second unnatural impulse that grace employs to overhaul the rule of self in the heart. And it is sympathy. Notice the command here, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Sympathy, it is to feel together with. To feel alongside of someone else what that person feels. It is to enter into their joy and to enter into their affliction. To rejoice with those who rejoice is to feel pleasure that someone else has what I did not get. If we all win a prize, it's easy to high-five each other, be excited together, but this command demands that we take joy in others rejoicing, particularly when we are not personally experiencing the same circumstances. And if you find yourself in a circumstance where verse 14 is connected to verse 15, what if somebody is mistreating you? What does it mean to put aside self and to turn around and rejoice in that one's rejoicing? That's a doubly tall task. If you respond well to someone who's making your life difficult and you pray that God would bless them and show favor to them and then your prayers are answered and that person is blessed by God in a way that you feel particularly not blessed by God, (laughs) the one who made himself your enemy is now in favorable circumstances that you yourself desired. This command is hard. You might find yourself saying, my life is dull and his life is exciting. My health is bad. Her health is good. I'm old. He's young. My finances are strained and she has extra. I fight so hard to get a B minus and A's come easy to that guy. Listen, it's not natural to take joy in the welfare of others when our own circumstances are to the contrary. And the second command here, weep with those who weep, is to enter into others' afflictions. And the second half of verse 15 might seem to come a little more naturally. Perhaps it's easier to enter into others' grief than it is to enter into others' happiness. (laughs) It feels more natural maybe to, to feel some sorrow when someone else is sad. But to truly enter into others' hardships as our own, I think this is more difficult than it looks. When a brother or sister in Christ is experiencing heartache through hardship, difficulty, trial, or sorrow, that heartache tends to be consuming. It it flavors every other experience. The heartache casts shade on other joys. It brings discouragement to the front of every other circumstance in life. And if you've ever gone swimming in Arizona in January, anybody, you know, build a new pool, you're tempted to jump in in January because it just got finished. And you've immersed yourself into that cold water and it takes your breath away. And and somebody else can come along and dip their toe in the edge and say, yep, that's cold. (laughs) They're not immersed the way you are. 
The one not experiencing a trial can dip his toe into another's sorrow for a moment. But to weep with their weeping is a much taller task, a much more immersive undertaking, and a much more selfless thing. To bear another's burden in this way means that my brother's sorrow flavors the other experiences of my life as well, becomes the burden of my prayers to God, and your hope is that in shouldering the burden of your sister or your brother in Christ, God might use you to lighten her load. That's what it means to weep with those who weep. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 11, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? That's the heartbeat we want. Some are much more advanced in this than others. Grace produces this to some degree in every Christian. If you lack this totally, you need to ask fundamental questions. Am I a Christian? But we're all growing in this and at various degrees but grace commands it of every Christian. Jesus himself, Isaiah 53, 3, was called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In Isaiah 53, 4, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. To rejoice in a brother's happiness is good, it pleases the Lord. To not rejoice in another brother's happiness, by definition here in this verse, is sin. To not grieve in another brother's sorrow is sin. We are members of one another. We have a share in one another. What are the heart attitudes that cripple our ability to rejoice with those who are rejoicing? I'll give you a list, and you can unpack these later. Self-absorption, self-interest, envy, entitlement, discontentment, pride, lack of love, lack of faith. Each of those is worth a sermon detailing how at the heart level they produce this crippling of our ability to rejoice with others when they're rejoicing. If you find in yourself a difficulty in rejoicing in God's good, sovereign, just dispensations of his grace in the lives of others, that ought to be a signal flag to you that there is work to do in rooting out the remnants of the reign of self in the heart. Why is it hard for me to rejoice with others who are rejoicing? And then just go trace these things out. Is it it entitlement, discontentment, pride, envy? What is it? Now, what are the hard attitudes that cripple our ability to weep with those who weep? Ignorance and apathy. What's that? I don't know, and I don't care. Right, you've heard that before. Ignorance and apathy. I don't know that my brother is suffering. That's a problem. We're supposed to be connected to one another. We're not supposed to neglect one another. We're not supposed to be oblivious to each other. That we can be self-absorbed and proud and not pay attention. That's a problem in our life together as a body. Or I don't care that my brother is hurting. Apathy, self-interest, lack of love, levity, silliness. You may have the attitude, well, they should just get over it because you can't relate and you haven't taken the effort to get into their shoes. These are problems that cripple our ability to weep with those who weep. Listen, it's particularly difficult to rejoice with others or to weep with others when my life is under the strain of some hardship. Do you know this? When your own life is consumed by the trials that God has you in the midst of, All we can see is our own trial. And if someone else is suffering, if we notice it at all, we either say, I know exactly how you feel. (laughs) I have this wicked hangnail. Or maybe we one-up their suffering and say, my trial's bigger than yours. And neither one of those is, is an appreciation of nor obedience to this command. It is a work of supernatural grace in the life of a believer when Through their own difficulties, Christians look beyond themselves with heartfelt sympathy upon those who are suffering lesser trials. And they enter into the grief of the other, losing themselves in love for their brothers and sisters in Christ. By the way, seeking to bear others' burdens while you yourself are suffering is good medicine. That's a good remedy for heart sorrows because you're forced to enlist God's help for grace to seek the welfare of others, even if your own circumstances might never change this side of heaven. All of this is the demolition of self under the reign of grace. There's a third 
quite unnatural impulse that grace must work in our hearts to progressively overthrow the tyranny of self. It's found in verse 16, and it is humility. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind. Associate with the lowly. Don't be wise in your own estimation. Four back-to-back-to-back-to-back commands promoting humility. In 1982, Larry Walters purchased an aluminum lawn chair and 45 helium-filled weather balloons. He hoped to fulfill his lifelong dreams of flying. He had milk jugs filled with water, a large bottle of soda, a CB radio, an altimeter, a camera, a pellet gun, and a parachute. He wanted to gently drift from the rooftop of his girlfriend's house and land 300 miles away in the Mojave Desert. When his mooring rope was cut by the sharp edge on the roof of his girlfriend's house, Larry rocketed into the sky. Within minutes, he was at 16,000 feet above Long Beach. And he was in the approach path to Long Beach Municipal Airport. A Delta and a TWA pilot both reported seeing a man floating through the sky in a chair. cold and dizzy as he hovered at 16,000 feet, Larry shot a couple of balloons with a pellet gun. He eventually descended and got tangled up into some high voltage power lines 10 miles from his takeoff point. He was rescued by fire crews and brought back down to earth. He was arrested and fined by the FAA. (laughs) You and I need to be brought back down to earth. We need humility. And the humility that Paul describes here is a pursuing unity in the thought, unity and thought with other believers, not being high minded, puffed up in our own minds, associating with the lowly, and not being wise in our own estimation. And all of these require you to put yourself aside, to take out the pellet gun and start shooting the balloons of pride that send us into the stratosphere, to come back down to earth. First of all, Paul says, be of the same mind. This is the setting aside of self for the sake of unity in the body of Christ, to lay down my preferences, my ideas. Really, anything that's not eternal, biblical, scriptural, truth, can I let it go? Just for the sake of being one in the body of Christ. Pride is the enemy of unity. It sets self up as antagonistic to everything that threatens self. And it takes supernatural humility under the reign of grace to set aside personal preferences, personal opinions, inconsequential things for the sake of unity with others. There is the postmodern approach to unity. You know how that goes? Um, Since truth is greatly a matter of perspective, and since all perspectives are equally valid, let's get unity by dropping the quest for truth altogether. You and I get together, we put everything we think out on the table, we compare notes, make adjustments, make compromises and sacrifices, and we can all come to agreements about whatever it is we believe. That's postmodernism. That's not the unity that the Bible has in mind. In fact, you and I will actually never arrive at real unity. We will never be of the same mind looking only to each other. We are to aim at Jesus rather than looking to each other and making compromises and finding the middle as if the truth were in the middle between us two. It's not. That's rarely where the truth is. We look up to Christ, and the closer that each of us gets to him by conformity to his word and the mind of Christ revealed in the Bible... The closer we get to that, the closer we will find ourselves to each other. As we become more conformed to his image, as we become more selfless and self-emptying in love, the closer we will be to each other. We look to Christ together. We look to God's word together and pursue a unity of mind. Philippians 2, have the same attitude which was in Christ Jesus. That's how we get the same mind with one another. And secondly, in verse 16, Paul says, do not be haughty in mind. Literally, do not exercise haughty pondering. High, lofty, self-exalting thoughts. This is a high self-estimation. The idea here is that you view yourself as worthy of special treatment. You. You believe that you should act as if you are the one with the superior intellect. That you have superior wisdom. 
greater discernment. Your ideas are better. Your preferences are preferable. You have better situational awareness. Maybe you have better life skills or your experiences make you better equipped. And conversely, you look down your nose at others. You have a low view of their opinions, their preferences, their ideas, their experiences. We've got to put these things to death. The third command of verse 16 is to associate with the lowly. Literally, be carried away with the lowly. This verb for being carried away was the verb used to describe Barnabas when he followed Peter into the hypocrisy of not letting Gentiles eat at the table. To be carried away with those ideas. Um, Here we are to be carried away with the lowly, not carried away by a bunch of helium balloons in a lawn chair over Long Beach Airport, but carried away in association with those that are considered low on the totem pole. This is a great contrast to being high in your own mind. Paul commands believers to be carried away with the lowly, and the original text here either indicates lowly people or lowly tasks. And either way, the import is the same. Nothing is below you. No one is below you. In the church, there is not to be a hierarchy of people. No believer has privileged status. There are to be no cliques, no caste system, no rank, no inner circles, no inapproachable groups, no aristocracy. You can't have the attitude that others are not cool enough for me or rich enough for me or theologically sophisticated enough for me or whatever categories you put in place. Are there people in the church that you just don't want to be around? They're the lowly. Go be carried away with them. Associate with them. And I know there are different types of social personalities, the social elite, the social butterfly, the social hermit. Right? And we might think that, that someone who's the social butterfly just does this easily, but just watch your heart. Watch who it is you gravitate towards. The shy person, the social elite, the the, the hermit, they, they all have things they need to correct in the heart. We all have to be ready and eager to hang out with the hoi polloi, to not turn our noses up at certain types of people. The supernatural grace is out to smash all of this pride Grace commands that we root this pride out in our hearts. The last command of verse 16 is, do not be wise in your own estimation. Bottom line, don't trust yourself. Trusting yourself is sin. Listen to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to counsel. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end is death. Proverbs 16, 2, all the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Proverbs 20, verse 9, who can say, I've cleansed my heart, I'm pure from sin. Proverbs 21, 2, every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. And Proverbs 26, 12, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. And Proverbs 28, 26, he who trusts in his own heart is a Disney princess. No, no, that's not what it says. (laughs) He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Listen, the dismantling of the reign of self is hard. And you might be thinking, you don't know the depths of what I'm going through. I'd say, you're right, who could? But there's another question that's critical. (laughs) Do you know the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God? Romans 11.33. Have you come to grips with the height and the breadth and the depth, the inexhaustible love of God for sinners, undeserved? Remember that Romans 12 contextually comes after Romans 1 to 11. 
I know that sounds obvious. Sometimes we forget it. Do you remember that Romans 1 to 11 is that giant Soyuz rocket with 300 tons of fuel that lifts the tiny little payload of stuff out of Earth's atmosphere? Romans 1 to 11, all of that doctrine, the, the gospel explained in detail is the fuel for the obedience that grace commands here. To be under the reign of grace and to seek to put self to death is fueled by Romans 1 to 11. In fact, if you're in a position where you find it difficult to respond with goodwill to those who are out to harm you, I would suggest a little exercise, maybe on a three by five card or something, something small that you can tape in your car or keep in your wallet or hold in your pocket. Just write out a summary outline of the book of Romans. Take out the book of Romans and, and just give a chapter heading to each chapter. And just remind yourself what Romans 1 to 11 is all about so that when you come to Romans 12 and verse 14, bless those who persecute you. You remember what fuels it, right? Remember Romans 1, Gentiles are sinners. Remember that? And Romans chapter 2, the Jews are sinners. And in case there was any confusion, chapter 3, all of us are sinners. There's no other category. And Romans 3, 21 and following, the, the, the gospel is revealed, not in law keeping, not by cleaning yourself up and doing good, but through faith in Jesus Christ, who God made as a propitiation in his death. That is, Jesus went to the cross and died as a substitute for sinners so that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ would have his entire record scrubbed, past, present, and future, and belong to God. It is justification by faith alone. And Romans chapter 4 is the example of Abraham who believes, and it's credited to him as righteousness. And chapter 5 is the fruits of justification. Now that we've been justified, we have peace with God, we exult in tribulation, we're growing, we experience the love of God poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Our solidarity with Adam has been exchanged for a solidarity with Christ. We are in Christ. And now at the end of Romans 5, we're under the reign of grace. And Romans chapter 6, because of that, is a new relationship to sin. We're no longer slaves. You're free. And in chapter 7, a new relationship to law. And in chapter 8, a new relationship to God by his Holy Spirit, by grace, so that we cry out, Abba, Father. We have a daddy, a tender father who loves us. And Romans 8, of course, begins with no condemnation and ends with no separation. And then Romans 9 to 11 is that great treatise on God keeping his promises. You can bank on these things. And we learn there that there's coming a day by God's grace when Jews who thought they were in by right will say, I don't deserve to be under God's favor. And Gentiles are saved in such a way that they say, how did I get to be in here? I don't deserve to be in God's favor. And all will be seen to be shut up in disobedience and rescued by God's grace alone, through faith alone, so that everyone who gets saved says, I don't belong here. And Romans 11 concludes, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord or become his counselor? Who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Bless those who persecute you. Let the fuel of Romans help in the obediences under the reign of grace to live out the truth that we don't deserve God's kindness. Let's pray. God, in view of your tender mercies towards us, we can only cry out, thank you, praise you, Our response is to yield ourselves as living sacrifices before you. We don't belong to ourselves. We are yours. Do with us as you please. Transform us, O oh God, from the inside out and let us not be squeezed into the world's way of thinking. Let us rather have our minds renewed 
Let us experience the revolution of grace, the uprising of grace in our own hearts that puts to death the deeds of the body, that takes aim at self and pride. God, may we have the heartbeat of the Apostle Paul or Stephen or your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to love, to love when we're mistreated, to be humble before you. And we ask these things for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.